Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so um, I'm here to talk about uh, using Wiz Windows Diagnostics for system compromise. Uh, if you're looking for the Jeep thing, it's next door, I think. So anyway, let's get started. Uh, so I'm Nicholas Berthum, uh, go by Aircon. I'm a penetration tester with Coal Fire Labs. I'm on IRC, probably more than is healthy for anyone alive. I like playing games, and I really like easy mode because you know what? Everybody likes the easy thing. There is going to be some delicate language in this. Um, if you're offended by that, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do anything about it. So, what is this about? Uh, is anyone here familiar with Windows troubleshooting? No? You've never had to fix a Windows box? <laughs> Reboot. Yeah, click it again. Yeah. So uh, what I, I'm doing is I'm going to talk about uh, using troubleshoot tools, troubleshooting tools to uh, bypass things like antivirus, do phishing attacks, uh, show you a toolkit on how to do it, do elevation, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, because uh, who here has trouble building macros that actually work, um, even with Bail and some of the tools that people have written for it? I know it's it's difficult. Uh, people that belt bail and, and what have you, and uh, it, it's it's like it's you have to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, so originally, I saw this as being a great avenue for replacing that, or at least augmenting it with something you don't require. It doesn't require Office. So uh, why should you be here? You want something uh, that can get by some hid systems because a lot of stuff will block. You know, macros via GPO or via some other security control, like a third-party hit system. Um, you have an interest in easy tools that are built for shells and recon. That's what I wrote there. Um, so basically, this is designed not just in this portion for getting a shell, not just for a fit football, but also for doing uh, post-exploitation recon on, on networks with a tool set that is portable and easy to write for. Uh, I, I like... PowerShell tricks, I'm sure a fair number of y'all do. And uh, if you're, as I said, if Drew's talk filled up, uh, you're here. <laughs> so uh, if not, it's, it's going to be really cool. So if you want to go, go do it. Anyway, he's one of my coworkers, by the way. So more power to him. Uh, so th this is a new technique. Um, I don't know if anybody else had talked about this before I did initially uh, at the ShmooCon blog, but. Uh, I've evolved that a little bit, and uh, I want to present it here. So um, I'm going to be uh, releasing a tool this week uh, that will allow this to be created on uh, Linux systems, uh, so you don't have to use some of the Microsoft tools. But I'll go over some of those because there are some reasons to use those that uh, aren't quite there yet on uh, the other platforms. Uh, and a newfound love for troubleshooting Windows. You're, you're going to have that, really. Yay! Uh, it will not be a perfect replacement. There are some problems with it. it. Like with every technique, there are some issues that you'll run into, and they're not always something you get past. Uh, you can roll it out with some work. You do have to do some steps. Uh, given the title, you will have to have a sound code signing key, for instance. Um, but those are $60 or more, and a few pieces of ID, and your force burden child. Stuff like that. Uh, there are no zero days in this, uh, and I'm not going to give you my code signing keys, nor will I give you stuff that I have signed that's got my name on it. All right, so the current state of the art, VBA macros. This may not be the current state of the art, and I just don't realize it, but that's what people often use for uh, embedding executable code or dropping in a zip file or something of that nature for getting a shell via phishing attack. So uh, encrypted files bypass detonation is what this can do. Uh, the tool I'm going to release has got a cryptor built into it uh, that requires user interaction. The great thing about user interaction is detonation systems are terrible at interacting with things like a person would. So it's very easy to get past those systems, even if they are looking for the file format that I'm going to go over. Um, you can do code caving um, to very low levels of success, but a lot of times the code caving stuff, if you use like a, an existing uh, DLL from interpreter or something like that can get caught and does get caught by a lot of AV now. Uh, 
you can also use zero days, but you know, those are really expensive and they get killed pretty quick as soon as they get widespread use. Uh, and, and you can get the thing where it's a signed applet and click five times in Java to get it to work. But you know what? Users like to click stuff. They don't like to click eight things and go across a bunch of menus as often. Still happens, but you know, it's, it's a lot of pain for them. So why not make it easy and use something that's already built in so they don't need Java? Okay. So they are really overkill. I found the GIF it funny. Uh, so what's that another? Diagnostic cabinets. Uh, who here has heard of that before? Seriously? Not even people I've shown the talk to before? <laughs> wow. Tough crowd. So it was designed uh, to facilitate uh, creation of diagnostic tools for originally for Microsoft, uh, but later it was integrated into the operating system so everyone could use them. So if you've ever done Microsoft support, they will send you uh, an EXE that will extract and actually install the, or use the tool on the operating system the, uh, and then call one of these diagnostic caps. Those would come in like and then upload the, the, the data back to Microsoft uh, for you know, troubleshooting. Um, that started, I believe, got it added in Windows XP um, and got further refined a little bit in Vista in 2008. And then with Windows 7, they added it as a permanent component so they no longer needed anything special, like an ex additional executable to enable that feature. So uh, the really nice thing about these, though, is they run uh, native PowerShell. So PowerShell is great. It's, it's the weapon of choice for everybody until people actually figure out how to turn it off. Hmm. Uh, it's easy to create uh, if you have a code signing key or you're able to add one to the key store of a system. And uh, it, it's commonly used mostly by Microsoft and hardware vendors to fix problems with their, their hardware. So um, what I'll go through is this is how you create them. And uh, these are some wonderful exploit uh, techniques you could use along with them to do additional uh, tasks. Uh, you can embed a lot of scripts. So you can take an existing vendor just like everyone, like every Android ADK that's uploaded to a third party and then backdoored and resold and all the other stuff. Similar thing, it's just a, essentially a zip file with a, a code signing manifest in it, which has, instead of Java or something else, it's going to have your PowerShell scripts as well as DLLs and other stuff. So you can actually use existing functionality, backdoor it, and then uh, inject your code, do whatever you need to. Um, it's uh, any shipping, uh, so say you've got Exchange Server, it has a set of PowerShell scriptlets and commandlets that are imported in there for manipulating Exchange Server or Office or any other Microsoft software or third-party software that has that, it's able to make use of those on that system. So you want to interact with it, you want to reconfigure it, you want to do some, you know, get some additional info, you can drop these things on and call those things natively. Uh, and it will allow you to enumerate them or, you know, check to see if they exist, pull information, then do other things. So, uh, it can be run directly by clicking, which is nice. People like to click, right? Um, and then the other way that you can do it uh, is by calling from the command line. So you can call this executable, which is in the path, Microsoft systems, and uh, supply it with a XML file, which tells it what to do. So there's no user interaction. Uh, you do need PowerShell 2.0, WinRM, so that's shipped uh, available for older operating systems, but uh, by default in Windows 7 and 2008 R2 Plus. Uh, it works on Windows RT, so if you ever see a Windows RT, which you probably never will, uh, it will it will run on that just fine. So there's no need for native code unless you use a DLL uh, to do it, so it works on the ARM platforms as well. Uh, and I guess it would also work on the Raspberry Pi build they have out there. I don't know if that's any good, but uh, it should work there as well. Uh, yeah, clicking next. There's no auto-execute MIME type, so unlike a Java with a J JNLP or uh, an EXE or something, uh, something would execute from the browser. Um, it doesn't have that functionality unless you go and add it. Um, and it requires uh, OCSP access in some situation. Talk to me later about this because it's, I haven't actually worked out all the bits about it, but it, it, 
the older the file is, the more likely it's going to work because it's already been checked for whatever reason. And then enabling a timestamp serve on it um, helps. Um, there, you need a, something to generate the XML to create these, a manifest, the code signing manifest, uh, create a, for the signature catalog, authenticate signatures are applied to it, of course, because that's, that's Microsoft code signing. Um, it's a nice part of the Windows 7 SDK, which is kind of a pain in the butt to install, but once you figure it out, they actually released a dyad cab to fix the installer to make sure you can use this, which is funny. Um, you do need one of those object code uh, uh, signing certs. And I've got this done. So this is coming out this week. This, this actually is, I should have taken this out. But uh, yeah, you'll have it. It'll be up on my GitHub tomorrow, hopefully. All right. So, but signing isn't hard. Uh, $60 from uh, Start SSL. Yeah. Uh, you can use another project. So if you've got some Java, it's not always in the key store, but you can also do in other things like uh, you want to sign an exe. It used to be that AV would ignore signed code executables, but you know, uh, I think that only works on a few subset of vendors now. So that's kind of uh, useful for other things. Also, you can say, I want my name on this thing. You can't screw with it. All right? And uh, it helps stop unauthorized people from taking your payload and then reusing it and changing the internals of it unless you supply them with the ability to interact with it in a way like uh, supplying a file that it calls or uh, when I get to the demo portion, you can actually pass it uh, different strings. So take the plunge, it, it hurts less. Okay, so let's you in PowerShell, you know, shell out code execution. Let's uh, intercepts it. Um, the only thing I heard before I even talked about this that did any kind of inspection. No AV well, it was a Palo Alto system. Um, some other stuff has added some support for it, but I've never seen them actually pick it up if you use custom code and, and whatnot uh, and have something that has user interaction, which is why I say detonating really isn't helpful for this sort of thing if you have anything that requires input before it does something malicious. Okay. Um, but So let's see this. So, uh, going to use a very basic uh, shell code inject from uh, PowerShell, or not PowerShell, PowerSploit, I apologize. Yay, resolution win. Okay. So, yeah, as I said, it's a diagnostic cabinet. This is all the Windows stuff. So, pops up. What does that look like to y'all? Every other Windows diagnostic troubleshoot? You might actually have seen this before. Yeah, so, what, what does that look like? Huh. Funny, it's built on the operating system. That's so strange. Why wouldn't Microsoft include diagnostic tools to fix itself? So let's make use of this. So this is a very basic example. It has a hard-coded IP return, uh, and it basically will send me a shell. Guess what? It's signed by me. Also, you can do fun things like set the privacy statement to Google. Yeah, it's, it's really private. So let's go. Let's do something very basic. It's detecting our problems. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, let's have our shell, please, work this time. Demo gods, please. All right, we'll try this again. Network stuff went down and up, so. Oh, it's resolving the problems now. Let's have it fix, of course. Try again. Oh no, what's that? That's a shell. Can y'all see that? What's that? Uh, I hint enter? Okay. 
I like shells. <laughs> Hooray, frog. Oh, Emit, you protect me so well. <sighs> yeah. So, yeah, my, my system here, Windows 8.1. Uh, it works fine on Windows 10 and Windows 7 uh, without any issue, uh, so long as the code signing stuff gets caught up with the, the OCSP server. Um, really easy. I'm not an administrator at this point, so please keep that in mind. The, it, but I'm able to do all the fun interpreter things, any kind of PowerShell. Um, what this was is just very basic PowerSploit. Um, reverse HTTPS interpreter. Wasn't caught by anything. Um, and, and it's really nice. So let's get back to our slides. <laughs> Present. Mm. So, click, click, click. The uh, UI to this is extremely straightforward. About as almost as simple as the UI that you interact with as a troubleshooting system. And uh, I will show you how to create one of these by literally copying, pasting code directly into a file, saving, and then just having it run. Try you have a cert. It's damn easy. It's easier than, well, what is easier than? That's a question. <laughs> All right. So, oh. so, number two. Real, real easy. All right. Let's go to this guy. So here's the, sorry, here's the interface. Basically, it is a root cause, so it's a troubleshooting application. All you have to do with this guy is take your, your code and drop it in and give it a couple of root causes here. It's got a global troubleshooter, which will do fun things. We'll get to that in a minute. It allows interactions. It has a resolver, which will be another script that would run. So what you can have do is do a troubleshooting file. Uh, have it do some recon, see, is this person the administrator's group? Is this person able to do this, that, and the other? And then pick what payload you want it to activate as a result, or grab and download for you, because if you have it already running, you can download arbitrary uh, PowerShell or whatever else, and it will still run it. You don't have to have that part of the signed package in order to do it. So that's also another benefit. This is Microsoft Visual Studio. Yeah, it's part of the Windows 7 uh, SDK. What? This is actually a standalone troubleshoot, troubleshooting designer, if you look up top here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't see the screen, so I can't see what y'all are seeing. Is that better? Right there. Okay. Uh, my good friend here, I will pass you the slides as well. All right, so it's got a resolver, a verifier, so you can verify the resolution was done properly. So if your shell didn't work or you have an outlook or you set an output, you can verify that stuff is working as you intended. Like, you know, you, you verify the fix worked or you verify you got your shell or you verify any other information you want to gather, which is wonderful. It's so useful. And then here's where you would do your scripts. Well, let's go in here. Windows PowerShell uh, integrated. Environment, ID, whatever the hell they call it, uh, is, is right here. So ba very basic uh, stuff. You drop in here, uh, and all the code that it requires is right here. So it tells you whether you fixed it or not. Okay? Well, below this is just the very basic shellcode exec. There's no encoding on this. This doesn't get picked up even if I drop it in there. Which is crazy. If you do, like, you, you unpack this thing, you do a strings, this, sh this should pop all sorts of AV. But they don't inspect it. In, it what? Yeah, it's, it's trusted because it's signed. I don't get it. But anyway, you drop in here, you invoke your shell code, and that's exactly what we did. We got our shell. All right? Let's go on to the next uh, little bit here. Um, I'll get to that in just a second uh, because that's the next little, little, little bitty. Uh, so, 
it has an option. Did you see that in the thing? It may have got cut off but for elevation. So that's that's a great little option. You just click a box and it's like, I want to elevate. I'm going to get administrator privs. And then uh, it bypasses UAC, the default settings. So uh, if you're not an admin, it will prompt for credentials. Uh, and it will not pre-populate the admin user like some things will do for it. But you know, if they have an administrative account, it will go in there. But the nice thing is you can use the troubleshooting script to see whether it men, and then uh, attempt to elevate based upon that operation. So it's really useful that. Um, yeah, and I found this without even looking. I was like, click. I'm sure it's going to do a UAC POM prompt and pop up. It's like, nope. Just wonderful. Because it's being run by the msdt.exe, which uh, you may have, there are some USA bypasses that would used to use like Explorer and other stuff because they would be calling stuff and you're doing it in their context and it would elevate. Some of those have been fixed, and it's the same concept because it is a Microsoft trusted application designed to fix stuff that users aren't able to do otherwise. So let's look at this. Okay. Which one? This one. So, yes, yeah, I said that's all you need. Click. But let's actually use it. All right, let's do something elevated. Yes, but elevating. Oh, detecting problems, not telling me a prompt. It's wonderful. Ah, but I've got another shell. You might notice something a little bit different here. Are you able to see the username of these guys? Is everyone able to see that? Good. Hmm, just that, so. It's not popping, it, popping up anything. Do it, do it. Oh, Ray. There we go. It's lovely, isn't it? I would load Mimi Cats and show you my password, but uh, we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll move on, all right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's going to continue to run here. And actually, there are ways uh, that in the toolkit, you can actually have it finish. And if somebody uh, it moves on to the next step, it'll give you another shell. And then if they cancel it, it'll give you another shell. And then you cancel it, it'll give you another shell. Until like you're finished, you're like, OK, I'm done. I'm going to kill the process. No more shells for me. But it's wonderful, because it like tries to rerun something if it didn't think it completed correctly. Um, it has the ability to send diagnostic, and I'll, I'll go over that in a minute, it, diagnostic information back to a central server. So whose server would that be? I don't know. <laughs> Come on, Google. User error? Yeah, couldn't be possibly Google. This is why you do not use the internet for anything. Seriously. <sighs> okay. You all can see that, hopefully. And if it doesn't work again, I will, I'll just go through it this way. What's that? I don't have it. Good. I, I like the troubleshooting. Thank you. Yeah. So, is this useful for target attacks? Oh, sh what are you doing? Uh, I'm not as skinny as those guys, so I really couldn't pull off a towel. Yeah. So, uh, 
So let's talk about making these better. Uh, I'm going to do a tool release, as I said. Um, I'm going to do it automatically to pull in. Hopefully, people don't, for April Fools, rename, you know, inject shell code to another name and leave it in the repo because that is just really obnoxious when people run stuff arbitrarily downloaded from the internet. I don't, whatever. So it will do it without uh, the need for any special uh, thing. And all right, generation of answer files. So what are answer files? Uh, they're, they're useful because uh, if you can ask it to do something, you can ask it to run it without a user interaction. So if you have an existing shell in a system, you can use this to arbitrarily to, you know, inject shell code into something else if your like, uh, uh, syringe is being blocked. So that's useful. And because it's trusted code, it's much less likely to get caught, at least at this point. Um, but if you use a cryptor, What's up? Uh, the only really way to do it is to disable the actual msdt.exe, which is a good idea. Um, and it works off of uh, web dev and off of uh, UNC path. So you don't even have to have the die cab listening, sitting on your place or have the answers file sitting there. So you can have the encrypted version on the system, call out to the answers file on a UNC share, and have it uh, come back and give the options like a, the decryption password, which is really nice. Um, and uh, you can have it send back, as I said, output. So there's a simple, there's a register key um, that actually I'll do in the persistence module for this, which will actually have a GG flip. And all you need to do is flip it and it will send all the data back to you. Uh, it will not store, do it locally, display it. So any errors or any post exploitation output you need is sent back to your controlled server, which is really nice. All right. So what do we learn? Uh, we haven't got to that point. I got one more demo for you. Uh, we can also have people do stuff like, I don't know, give us answers, which would be really useful if you want to have somebody pick one or zero or whatever else. Uh, okay. So we can pass parameters to it. So where is the shell going? So the reason this is useful, can anyone guess? to put the IP in there. You drop this on a system, you give it an answers file, I want to send a shell to someplace else. That's great. Uh, I can also do things like I want to do this particular scriptlet, or I want to do a full PowerShell interpreter popped up for me that it would otherwise be blocked. It's useful, so try this. Port, oh, that's fine. All right, send me another shell. Sorry, not screen. Sorry. <sighs> yeah, that's that's really useful. So you can have it do parameters and, and have it do dynamics. So you can make a generic one. So if you have like a list, you don't know what your internal IP is going to be, you can have a listener. Also, uh, one thing that's on the future that I, I'm going to do things like, uh, and I'll show you, add things to it like uh, enabling Terado and making it default. So you can tunnel out of something that, who here knows what Terado is? No one. Oh, that guy. Okay. Terado is Microsoft, one of Microsoft's IPv6 tunneling adapters. And uh, fortunately, Microsoft also supplies this wonderful service for all Windows systems ever equipped with Terado, hosted on their system to do callbacks to them to tunnel IPv6 over IPv4. So you, if you enable that, you can have shell listener sitting on Terado or have it do a callback to Microsoft from Microsoft's cloud. And people are going to trust Microsoft's cloud. It's extremely easy to enable that with PowerShell. That's one of the few things that I, I would like to include this. Anyway, um, you don't need all, and uh, so what have we learned? So it's magic, uh, it does USA bypass. Does not use a whole, uses existing functionality. Um, there, there are ways to mitigate this, but honestly, it's built into the system. It's integrated, obviously, with all the operating system. And in order to rip that out or disable it, you really do have to harden the machine considerably more than uh, you can with any of the existing hardening profiles I've seen out there. It does not disable this functionality. So, uh, yeah, disable this. I found out you, it's not there. 
Uh, don't run it as in men. Well, you still get a shell. Where's all the user data? In the user's uh, folders, whatever. Um, block this extension. That's probably the best way because only a few select people other than Microsoft actually use this right now. Um, they're, they're typically hardware providers. So if you see these coming down, uh, it's your proxy logs or in your mail, it, it would probably be better idea just to block it entirely, uh, like you would with an EXE or, or something else. So, uh, And then alert on any that aren't signed by Microsoft. This is actually pretty easy to do relative to disabling PowerShell. Um, and because the small number of institutions that actually use these that are not local administrators, um, which I've seen one instance where people actually build roll these themselves, they are they're not going to be signed by Microsoft, so you can you can do the pull the metadata off the signing cert. So, uh, so what's next? Uh, as I said, there are some problems with this. Um, if you signed it recently and you're use, not using a time stamping service, sometimes the if you drop it on a system, it will not work for a couple of days um, for whatever reason because it hasn't verified or something. It's a, I'm trying to figure out the root of this. But that's the next thing, so this will be more effective on systems because I actually had somebody tell me that they tried this on an engagement and it, it didn't work because that system, I believe, wasn't able to call back to an OCSP server and then check for the validity of the cert. So time stamping service should help with this, but it doesn't always, right? Um, and as I said, uh, including things like enabling tarot, tarot, and uh, using that for alternate connectbacks listeners, you can do changes to the operating system. So, uh, so these are references, and for all the great things, so like uh, Windows SDK, okay. this is everything you'll need to deal with, do any of the examples that I did here. And as I said, the tool will actually download all the resources you need to build these. So, and actually, I would love a cool name for a tool because I couldn't, for the life of me, figure something out. So, if anyone has a suggestion, I will name it that if it's decent. All right, but uh, I'd like to thank all these people. Uh, my employer for letting me attend, Novaha. Anybody here from Novaha? Nova Hackers, that guy in the back. You move away and nobody's there. Uh, Powers Point in the Veil Project for, uh, for having all the code already written for me so I don't have to do any actual coding except for a few things to generate some XML manifests and sign stuff. Uh, Microsoft for making it easy. My Kitos. And uh, DerbyCon. It's wonderful. Great, great conference. Uh, so you can contact me. Um, and let me open up the questions. Dot, dot diet cap. So let me bring that up here. So like that. Sorry? Um, I'll post some online and share them out. Um, or I can come, you can come up and I'll, I'll give you a copy of the PDF. Yeah. So you can actually supply an icon, but you know what that icon is housed in? It's housed in a DLL. So you can actually use that for reflective injection because it's actually running the code that's in the DLL when the, when the system is, when the, the thing is started. So they don't have to necessarily just click the next button. Okay, so you have to start on wrong. Yep. Yeah, so just like all the other uh, things, the answer file can, you, the script, the program I'm going to release actually has, will generate that for you. But also you can, the answer file, if you have a parameter saying you want to do it elevated or not at runtime, you can actually script that out. So with uh, just applying it the XML.
There is, but I need to talk to Microsoft about that first because there is actually something needs to be fixed before I'm going to talk about it publicly. Uh, you may be able to investigate on your own and figure it out because it's really not all that hard to find. But I'm not. I, I won't give you specifics about some more because it is a vulnerability at this point. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much.